All right, good morning, guys. I was thinking maybe just waiting a minute for everyone to pour in, but it doesn't look like we're going to get very many more, so that's okay. Uh, if you don't mind giving me a green check mark so we can figure out everything's going properly, and then we'll get started. I have a feeling a few people will probably trickle in, but uh, I know Taylor mentioned that there wasn't a huge turnout for English. Thanks everyone for those check marks. All right, so today I promised I would go over any questions you might have had from the learning guide with the caveat that you actually went back and looked at your notes or a video to try to figure out the answer uh, or the sort of method or solution to figure it out. Because again, at this point in the year, me doing more problems isn't going to uh, teach you anything. All the materials there, it's kind of up to you to go back and uh, review. So if there's anything you had questions about from the learning guide, you can throw those into chat. If there's nothing from the learning guide, then I will just assume you guys are doing fine. And I can go on to the provincial exam and point out a few things that uh, I think are kind of important about writing the provincial exam in terms of uh, answering the questions and how to eliminate some answers. There's always ways to do that to make uh, your chances a little bit greater. So I don't see anyone with questions about the learning guide. Can you maybe just type in that you're you know, working through it and it's going okay? And that would make me feel better about this whole situation instead of just no questions. I know when only like half the students are here, then you know, we'll probably get fewer questions, but okay. Uh, yep, so a couple things coming in. Shane is in as well, which is good. So can you go over finding the missing side with the sign? And then should we print out the provincial to go along with you? Yeah, you can print out the provincial or, I mean, if you just want to, you know, write your answers down on a separate sheet of paper and you can just have a list of like number one was A and this is how I did it. Number two, that's fine as well. Sometimes it's nice to have the questions. There's some graphing stuff and if you're trying to find the slope on a computer screen, it can be a bit difficult. I kind of prefer to have paper, but um, there you go. So Abby doesn't have any questions and Taylor's done the first page, which is okay. Uh, so we will have this done by Monday. That's kind of the hope where your um, midterm exam is going to happen. You can bring it with you or submit it uh, over the weekend. That'd be great. I mean, it's not a ton of work, but it is a bit, so you don't want to leave it to the last minute. And what I'm going to do uh, is... Um, what I'm going to do is just let you guys know about the one sheet that I had mentioned previously and it had all the topics on it and I had asked that you guys kind of submit that. So in the course, I have this final exam topic study guide. It's at the bottom of the unit eight section. And that was just the Word document with all the sections and all the lessons we did. And what I would like you guys to do, I know there's only a few of you, so not everyone's going to hear me say this, but for those of you who are here, if you wouldn't mind over the next day or two um, before Friday, going through that and then just submit it down below. It's nothing fancy. I'm, I'm not going to grade it. I'm not going to mark it or anything. But um, what I would like you to do is just submit that just so I know that you've gone through and you can identify areas you need to focus on. And it helps me as a teacher because when I look, if everyone says, you know, section 1.2 is really hard and I didn't really get it the first time, I need to learn it. If everybody has the same section, then I know I can spend more time on that section when I do the class again next year. So it's kind of going to help you organize your studying and help you focus on areas where you need to go back. And then um, it'll also help me to focus on areas of sort of improvement in terms of my instruction where uh, things can, you know, go a little bit better. So uh, welcome, Ava. No worries about that. It's acceptable. 
Uh, nobody has any questions about this. I'll ask again tomorrow. So if you do run into a problem between today and tomorrow, that's fine. What I will do is I'll go through this practice exam that uh, I printed or I, I uploaded to the course a couple days ago. And I'll go through a few questions and I'll maybe identify some of the more difficult ones. And basically my goal here isn't to just show you how to do a provincial exam, is to show you that questions have, generally speaking, there's always a way to eliminate two of the four answers. And if you know just a little bit of information, you don't know how, need to know how to do the question, but if you can figure out a little bit, um, you can usually increase your chances if you're not understanding a topic. So Taylor's asking, how do I get this? Uh, so in the course, if we are at the bottom of the, the very bottom of the course, it says prepare. If you click there, uh, it says practice exam January 13th and 14th. So that is a PDF of the test I'm gonna go through today. So this is an old provincial exam and uh, I've just literally just copied it and put it up here. So uh, if you want to download it, that's where it is in the prepare section, getting ready for your provincial practice exam in class January 13th, 14th. So what I'll do is I'll go over it for the next uh, uh, couple classes today and tomorrow. And then I will post the answers up. I, I probably won't have a chance to go through all the problems because we don't have a ton of time, but uh, I'll post the answers up in the course as well, uh, maybe tomorrow, and uh, we can go from there. So here we go. If you have questions along the way, let me know by all means. And uh, I just hope to give you some, you know, test writing sort of tips and help, especially when it comes to this exam, because it can get a bit tricky. So I know it didn't copy perfectly because it's been photocopied a few times but um, for questions like this it's just asking how to find the slope you know that's a pretty straightforward uh, question and there are questions on the exam that are going to be like this just finding the slope rise over run pick two points rise over run or you can use the slope formula if you like uh, either way number one easy mark one thing I should mention before we get here is the first 12 questions are no calculator questions. So you're gonna see that there's some radicals and things in there that you think, wow, I could just plug that into my calculator, it'd be so easy. But unfortunately, you only have 40 minutes to do these first 12 questions. And you'll see it doesn't usually take 40 minutes to do them, but you're not allowed your calculator until uh, 40 minutes into the test. So it suggests that it, this should take 30 minutes to go through each of the 12 questions. It's about two minutes a question. But looking at the first question, finding the slope, it's not going to take you two minutes to find the slope. Some questions will take longer, some won't take very long at all. Um, all right, so I went through this exam actually uh, a couple days ago, and I'll just point out a few things. Uh, the first one here, you can see that the line is going up and to the right. So, sorry, my backwards, up and to the right, there we go. Um, the idea here is that even if you didn't know how to find the slope, if you could identify that as a positive slope, something going up and to the right, then you could eliminate some of the answers here. If you look at AB, you can see that these are both negative slopes. So if I have something with a negative slope, it's gonna go down to the right. So automatically, I can get rid of those two. And then that leaves C and D. So without even counting dots on the graph, uh, I can just look at it and say, okay, well, rise is going to be 2 and run is going to be 7. That seems like a, I mean, I go up 2 over 7. It's going to be a really shallow slope. The, the graph up above is really steep. So without even looking at the graph, I can identify the answer to the question. Um, what if down to the right instead it's going up and to the left? Well, that would be a, a negative slope as well. But usually we go rise over run, we put the negative on top, so we'd always go up and down to begin with, just kind of a habit that I tried to get into. Uh, the second page is all blank, which is supposed to happen. So there's number one, second page is blank. 
Use the following graph to answer question number two. So we have a vertical line. And this gets back to the idea of a vertical line having an undefined slope and a horizontal line having zero slope. What the difference between those things is. So we look at our line. It's a bit hard to see. The line is right here. All right, so we have a vertical line at uh, x equals negative 2. And that's it. So that's all the information we have. So we need to come up with the uh, equation of the line. Think about it this way. Y is mx plus b. I don't have a y-intercept. This is equal 0 in this question. So I'm going to have something that just looks like y is mx. Uh, the slope is undefined. So what am I going to end up with here? Um, I have x equals negative 2 as my line, my point. What I can do is say, okay, I'm just going to rearrange this. I'm going to get x plus 2 equals 0. And then from there I can um, see that that is letter D. So x plus 2 equals 0 is the same thing as x equals negative 2 is the same thing as D. So the first two here, these are both horizontal lines, and then the last two are lines, vertical lines at x equals positive 2 and x equals negative 2. So, I mean, not terribly difficult, but kind of tricky maybe a little bit. That's stuff we didn't spend a ton of time looking at. So number three, which of the following graphs represents y is mx plus b, where m is less than 0 or negative? and b is greater than 0 or positive. So we look at the questions, you know, we have a positive b, so a positive y-intercept. Um, so you're a bit confused by number 2, okay. I'm trying to think of another way to explain it. Um, Basically, it doesn't matter what y is. y could be negative 5. x is going to be negative 2. y could be, uh, you know, positive 7 way up here, and x is negative 2. So it doesn't matter what y is. x is always going to be the same thing. So uh, we don't have any y values in our line. I don't know. Uh, we could think of something, maybe let's look at uh, eliminating these ones. If I had something like this, I'd get y is equal to positive 2. So here's y is positive 2. Trying to find 2. Doesn't matter what x is, y is always going to be positive 2. So that's going to be a horizontal line at y is 2. So that is a. Uh, B is going to be the same thing except at negative 2. So we're going to have a horizontal line there. So that's B. And then C is going to be a vertical line at x is positive 2. And there's C. So that leaves D as the correct answer. I'm not sure that there's an easy way to understand that. Um, just, yeah, you don't have a y-intercept because you only have an x term. I'm not sure. Um, maybe eliminate the ones you do understand and go from there. So for number three, I see that b is greater than zero. Even if I don't get that the negative positive slope thing, I don't understand what m is, I can say, oh, I remember b is the y-intercept and it's positive. So automatically, c and d both have negative y-intercepts, so I need to pick from A and B. And a negative slope is uh, down and to the right. So we're going to identify it as a B. What would C look like? From up above, Taylor, number two. 
C would be a vertical line at x equals uh, positive 2. That answers your question, hopefully. All right, so uh, negative slopes down to the right and a positive y-intercept. So again, an easy mark. Uh, using the indicated point on the equation, slope point form. So you can see all of the answers are in slope point form. Uh, I, can, uh, I can see that my slope is going up and to the right, so it's a positive slope. And automatically I can eliminate B and D. D because those both have negative slopes. So it's not going to be B and D. My point is given here. It tells me I have to use point 1, 2, 3, comma 1. This is the point there. And then from there I can figure out my slope. If I go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and over 1, 2, 3, Looks like my slope is 4 over 3. So I have a point and I have a slope. Now I could break out my formula sheet and see the uh, slope point form of an equation is going to be y minus y1 is m times x minus x1. I plug in my slope. For m, I plug in my x1 and y1 for my points. So I get y minus 1 is 4 over 3, x minus 3. And that looks like letter C. Number five, greatest common factor of 28 and 42. Now you could, I mean these are pretty small numbers so you could probably just do this in your head or on a calculator if you had one, but you don't. So it's in the no calculator section, you need to solve this without a calculator, kind of you know do it this way so you'll have to um, find the prime factors of it. So if you remember finding the GCF of both of these two things, you need to do a factor tree. So remember, you don't have a calculator either. What about the C, C, and cotan? Uh, yeah, Alex, those are trig functions that we won't deal with in grade 10. So you just need sine, cosine, and tangent. So mental math time. Uh, if you're not good at multiplication, stick with easy numbers. I can think, okay, 28 divided in half is going to be 14. That's good. Uh, 14 is going to be 7 and 2. So I have that one. 42, same thing. I could go, okay, that's 21 times 2. And 21 is 7 times 3. So what are my prime factors of these two guys? Well, here I have 2. Sorry. 2 times 2 times 7, and here I have 2 times 3 times 7. So what is common to both of these things? Well, they both have a 2, and they both have a 7. So what is my GCF? It's going to be 2 times 7, or 14. So again, all of that without a calculator. So we're at five. Number six. Oh no, the square root of 360. No calculator. Oh, what am I gonna do? Well, we're simplifying it, so that means we wanna figure out if there's any perfect squares that go in there. And conveniently, and they'll always do this, they'll pick something that kind of works out. So the little light bulb should go off in your head when you see a number like 36, and you think, hmm, 36, that's special, it's a perfect square. So what am I gonna break down my uh, square root into? Well, I'm gonna break it down into 36 times 10. So I'm gonna have the square root of 36 times the square root of 10, and the square root of 36 is six times root 10. 
which is my answer. So they've picked a perfect square for you. And whether you recognize it or not, um, that is what it is. The next one's kind of one of these cruel questions where they make you do three questions in one and then um, you know order them from greatest to smallest. So order the numbers from the smallest to the largest value. The first one's root 18. Um, what is the square root of 18? I don't know. But I do know that there are perfect squares on the either side, uh, either side of 18. So if I had uh, 4 times 4 is 16, so the square root of 16 is going to be equal to 4. And then square root of 25 is equal to 5. So what is that closer to? Is 18 closer to 16 or is 18 closer to 25? I'm going to say 18 is a little bit closer to 16. So if I had to estimate it, I know it's between 4 and 5, and it's probably closer a little bit to 4. So it's going to be about 4 point, I don't know, 3 or 4. That would be my guess. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, the cube root of 64, that turns out to be a perfect cube. Uh, 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 is 64. Again, all of this without a calculator can be tricky. So if you don't know your perfect cubes and squares, you should learn them. And then this last one is 121 on the top and 9 on the bottom. Both perfect squares. This is 11 over 3. And 3 goes into 11, um, 3 point something 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 times. So my numbers are 3, 4, and 4.3. And these are just estimates. I'm just, just, you know, shooting in the dark here, estimating what these values are. So it asked me to do smallest to largest. The smallest is going to be 3, Roman numeral 3 here. The next smallest is going to be 2. And then the next is going to be 1. So 3, 2, and 1 is D. That's a bit of a tricky one. Three questions at once. They'll do that. Uh, determine the approximate value of the square root of 31 on the number line below. So similar to what we did for uh, the square root of 18 above. So square root of 31. What is it between? Well, 5 squared is... Uh, 25 and 6 squared is 36. So this is between 5 and 6, which is indicated here. So I don't, it's not a, a shot in the dark, but I have, you know, goalposts to get between. And then is 31 closer to 25? Well, it's about 6 away from 25, and it's about 5 away from 36. So it's going to be somewhere between in the middle. Um, is it going to be bigger? then 5.5 or is it going to be smaller than 5.5? I'm going to say it's going to be a little bit bigger than 5.5 because it's closer to the square root of 36. So if I had to pick, I would pick C because it is a little bit closer to the 36. Number nine, uh, exponent laws without a calculator. No big deal. Uh, I remember flowers of power roots the root, so I'm going to change this to the third root of negative 27, and then the third root of 27 is 3, or negative 3. You can see what they've done here is answers C and D are both wrong, but they say Okay, what is a common mistake that students always make? Well, they see a fractional exponent, and then they think, oh, if I have a fractional exponent, I have to flip whatever I'm dealing with. Not the case. Flowers of power roots the root. Remember that. So C and D are both wrong, but the unsuspecting Math 10 student will pick one of them because as soon as they see a fractional exponent, they think they have to flip what's going on. We only flip when we have negative exponents. So uh, they, they know the common mistakes and they'll put answers in for common mistakes and you'll finish a question, you'll get it, your answer will be there and you'll be so excited and then you'll actually end up getting it wrong and you won't ever know because you don't get to see how your test was marked. 
So it is what it is. Uh, Su Yon is five inch, uh, five foot four inches tall. Which of the following calculations will convert her height to centimeters? Okay, so one problem is that both C and D have five foot four inches as being equal to 5.4, which is not the case. Feet doesn't work in a base, uh, base 10 system like we normally count. Remember if I have, uh, there's 12 inches is one foot. So 5.4 doesn't equal five foot four inches. So automatically C and D are answers I can get rid of. From here, I'm just gonna look at my, my units. I don't even care if you know the calculation's right or not, but I see I have feet on the top, cancels with feet on the bottom, I'm left with inches. I have inches on the top, I have inches on the bottom, I'm left with centimeters. That's looking right. Here I have feet canceling with feet, inches canceling with centimeters. Nope, on the top I have inches and inches, so that's gonna be inches squared, which is not what I want. Conversely, you could just do the question. You could just calculate it, convert it into, um, convert it into height in centimeters and you can go from there. But you can see that there's no actual answers for any of these questions. They haven't actually done the calculation. They're not concerned about the answer. They're concerned that you know how to do the conversion. Again, you can use your formula sheet for that, but you don't really even need it if you play your cards right. Now number 11 I've seen a few times, and it is a super easy mark that appears extremely difficult. So the objects below have the same base, area, and height. So they're the, a cone that fits into a cylinder. And then it asks which of the following statements are true. The cone and cylinder have the same volume, the cone has half the volume of the cylinder, the cone has one third of the volume of the cylinder, and the cone has one quarter of the volume of the cylinder. And to an average Math 10 student, you're gonna look at this question and you're gonna absolutely panic because there's no numbers on it. How am I supposed to figure this out, Mr. Borden? There's no numbers. I don't have what the radius is, I don't have what the slant height is, I don't have what the height. How am I possibly supposed to figure this out? Well, I guess the key lies in your formula sheet. Now, on your formula sheet, if you happen to have one nearby, it says the, um, we're talking about volumes, so the volume of the cone is one-third area of the base times height, and the volume of the cylinder is area of the base times height. What is the difference between these two formulas? The only thing different between them is a third. So assuming they have the same base area and assuming they have the same height, which it says in the question, it means that the cone is, volume is gonna be exactly one third. So this is C. Super easy mark if you know what you're looking for. And because there's no numbers in there, that can be a hard question. You kind of look at it and you kind of panic a little bit, but it's okay. Look at the formula, look at what you're given, look at information you have, things at your disposal and go from there. So that's kind of one of these volume facts that you probably should just know. Uh, the last one, number 12, is a trig question, again, without your calculator, but it's just seeing if you can identify your trig angles. So in the formula sheet again, all of your uh, sine, cosine, and tangent sides are all included on there. So you don't even need to memorize SOHCAHTOA. But of course you have so SOHCAHTOA. And in this case you have the cosine. So we're dealing with the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. So maybe I look here. Well, this is dealing with the opposite. So I don't want A. Uh, I start here. This is the opposite again. So I don't want B. That leaves these two. Uh, I go across here. That's the opposite. 
So I'm not interested in C, and I go here. That's my opposite. And this is my adjacent. Um, so what's going on? Did I make a mistake somewhere? Did I make a error? What do we think? Uh, for letter A here, you always have to start at the angle you're given. Yeah, Abby picked it up. So we're given this angle up here. I started with all the other angles. So don't automatically just jump to this bottom angle because that's what most of the questions have. So this one is my opposite here. So this is my hypotenuse and this is my adjacent. So it is in fact A. Uh, so that ends the, you know, the first 12 question section of the test. So how long did that take me? It's 11.01, we started about 10 minutes late. So me explaining questions, you know, it only took me, you know, 20-ish minutes. So now I still have no calculator for another 20 minutes but I can move on to the additional questions on the test. So you'll see that right now, uh, like number 13, I don't need a calculator to solve this. And you'll see that a bunch of these additional questions I won't need a calculator to solve. There's lots of questions here you won't need a calculator to solve. So don't think, oh, I have to stop and just wait until the 40 minutes is up so I can use my calculator. No, just keep going. Go through the questions and um, if you come to one that you need a calculator to solve and you're not allowed your calculator yet, then that's okay. Just move on to the next one. Um, I'm going to maybe, well, let's see if there's anything super tricky here. You know what? Number 13 is a bit of a tricky one. So I'll go through 13 and then I'll give you guys a little bit of time to flip through the test uh, to maybe look at some of the questions and ask a few that kind of jump out at you as you know a bit more difficult. So number 13 is uh, a tough one and uh, I'll mention it. So Sarah bought 10 pairs of shoes at a massive uh, shoe sale for $8 a pair. She plans to sell them for $20 a pair, which will the following represents her profit in P dollars uh, versus the number of shoes sold S. So when we talk about profit, that is, I mean, this is one of these things that we don't talk about in math, but it's just assumed that you know. So profit is how much money you've made, and then you have to take away the money that it actually costs you. So once you start making money, you have an initial cost, and then the money you make on top of it. The other thing that's happening in this question is we're talking about pairs of shoes, and you'll notice letters A and B have different structures. So we have a continuous line here and we have dots here. So what am I going to do? I can eliminate two of these answers automatically because I either am gonna have a continuous set of data, a straight line, or I'm going to have dots. And what do we think? When I'm talking about shoes, am I gonna have dots or am I gonna have a continuous line? What do we think? Ideas? You got one or the other. Can't pick both. We have one continuous and one dot. Okay. So I guess I'll ask this question. Oh, no dots. <laughs> Can you have a half a pair of shoes? Can you sell half a pair? Or is it, uh, is it fixed? Do you have to sell a pair at a time? Can I sell a quarter of a pair of shoes? So it definitely is the dots. So A and C we can get rid of because, yeah, you can sell half a pair, I guess, but nobody's going to want to buy one shoe. Well, I guess if you lost a shoe, you'd want to buy one shoe, but that doesn't ever happen. It's difficult to go to a store like Sport Check and say, hey, I'd love to buy a quarter of that shoe right there. The guy's girl's going to look at you and be like, 
sorry, we can't do that. The other thing that happens in this question that's a bit cruel is that uh, each pair of shoes she sells, she makes $12. So it costs her eight, she sells it for 20. So she makes uh, $12 per pair. So if you're making $12 a pair, you'd think that if I sold one pair, I'd make $12, two pairs, 24, and I'd have something that kind of looks like letter B here. But the kicker is this, she had to buy 10 pairs right from the get-go at $8 a pair. So her initial cost, initially, T-I-A-L, initial cost is $80. So before she even sells a pair of shoes, She's in debt $80. She hasn't made any money yet when she buys all of these shoes. So the letter D starts off at 80. She sells pairs, sells pairs. Once she's at four pairs, now she starts to make money or she's in the, in the black, as they like to say. So uh, letter D is the correct one. All right, I'm gonna take a break, maybe uh, 15, no, that's too long. Uh, let's go 10 minutes, because that'll give you just a chance to flip through a few of these. So keep in mind, we're on question uh, like 14, and we've been going for about 30 minutes or so. So we're, we're doing okay, we're on, a, we're on a good pace, even with me talking and things like that. So uh, we'll put 10 minutes up. Uh, just flip through it if you've printed it off, awesome. Maybe identify some questions you want to look at. And if you haven't printed it off, just kind of scroll through and see what's there. And I'll see you guys back in 10 minutes.
Hi guys, welcome back. See Taylor, you put 21 in there, which is good. I will definitely get to that. And then uh, I was sitting here for 10 minutes, maybe about seven of the 10, staring at this question and something really struck me as being odd. And this is kind of the, I guess, what happens when we try to go over a provincial exam. Um, when I looked at uh, this letter D here, graph D, I see one, two, three, four. So at four pairs, we have zero dollars. But this is plotting profit. So we said up above that she makes $12 on each. So I'm thinking, well, if I started with $80 in debt and I sold four pairs, four times 12, that's only $48. So I, I haven't gotten out of debt yet if I've only sold four pairs. So I got to thinking a little bit further and I changed my mind on this question. Um, I don't like D anymore, bad D. Uh, it makes more sense to pick uh, letter B. And the reason that is, is because if we have profit, uh, the profit's $12 for one pair. So if I sold 10 pairs, that'd be up here, and that would be $120. That makes sense to me. Or five pairs is $60. So I guess they're, she, she does sell them for $20 each, but it's not how much she's selling them for, it's the profit. So I guess you could argue for either one, but I'm thinking that it's B now, changing my mind, unless you can convince me otherwise. Um, she buys for 10, for $8 each, and she sells four pairs, that's 20 each. Uh, she's made her 80 back, then she's at zero dollars profit. See, now you're convincing me the other way. I don't know. I'm still thinking it's B now. Because profit, you know, she was $80 in debt. I think, I'm thinking just profit. We're confusing like how much money she's made with profit. So, I don't know. It's, a, it's one of these things where it's open to some interpretation. Uh, I honestly don't know what the correct answer is. I can't just say, oh, the answer is D. That's the answer they're looking for. The answer is B. Um, it's going to be either D or B. I'll go look up profit and what the definition of profit is, and then I can come back next day and have a better answer for you. But I want to just be sure on that. No, I don't have an answer key for this, Abby. Uh, just like when you guys sit down to write your exam, um, uh, when you guys write your exam next Wednesday, or uh, sorry, a week from Wednesday, uh, two weeks, two weeks from today, you guys have a provincial, two weeks from today. Um, when you guys sit down to write your exam, I won't have seen the test, and when you are done your exam, I won't know the answers to any of the questions. I have to go through it on my own, and uh, I go from there. This isn't one of the ones that was on the website, so... Um, yeah, anyways, I'll leave it at that. So I'm going to look up profit. I'm going to figure out the definitions, and uh, uh, we'll get back to it. Taylor's chiming in with a big paragraph. Uh, here's the definition of profit according to Google. <laughs> financial gain, especially the difference between the amount earned and the amount spent in buying, operating, or producing something. So now I'm kind of leaning back towards D. Maybe I, maybe I convinced myself otherwise. Um, okay. You guys have done an excellent job of convincing me it was, it was D. I'm gonna stick with my gut on this one. Uh, it's not B. With Taylor's definition, uh, we have that cost in there. I like what Alex said, once we've bought four, we're back to zero, and then you know, if I sell another pair after four, I now start making money. I like that, that works for me. We'll go with that. So it's D, my gut was right. You guys have confirmed that, I shouldn't have doubted myself. Just like you, when you're on your test, shouldn't doubt yourself. Uh, what I'll do is, uh, Taylor wanted 21, which I'll get to. I'll spend another five minutes and then I'll, I'll let you guys go. Uh, this number 14 is, the only trick here is the difference between a square bracket and a open bracket. So remember, if I have a, a closed dot, that's gonna be a square bracket, and if I have an open dot, that's gonna be a round bracket. So that, uh, that means this is uh, wrong automatically. Answer turns out to be A. 
Uh, I'll post up all the answers to these. Uh, this is which of the following are functions. So this is a vertical line test question. If you can draw a vertical line, then intersects more than one point, not a function. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, 16 is a bit tricky. I'll definitely go over that one next day. Uh, but I want to get to 21 because Taylor asked about that. Uh, data is collected for each situation below when graphed, which, resent, uh, which will re represent a linear function. So we want something that's a straight line, not a curve. That's kind of the key here. Number of people in a mall. So at 1 o'clock, you know, that's busy middle of the day, there'll be a bunch of people in your mall. And then, I don't know, maybe there's a peak at like 5 o'clock once everyone gets off work, and then the mall will eventually kind of close. That would be kind of my guess there. So I'm going to go with not A. That's not a straight line. Uh, B, total number of vis uh, visits to a website in time and days. So I'm thinking a website, are you, is a website going to get the, the same uh, number of hits each day? Probably not. Day one, you might have, you know, like 50 hits. So you might go there, and then day two gets higher, and then day three, maybe there's only 20 people, and day four is Sunday, so nobody's on your website. I would argue that that's probably not linear. Uh, height of a basketball, uh, it starts at the person's hand, which is above the ground. It goes up in the air, and then the height would go back down to some other level here, like a hoop, so I'm, that's changing. And the number of days until you graduate. So. If today is, you know, you have like a year, two years left, 600, 700 days, let's say, uh, that's just going to continually go down until you get to 700 days, and then it's going to be zero. So uh, D is going to be the, the linear one. So that was a, a good question. And... There you go. Uh, is anybody else having issues with the, the PDF not coming out properly, the tops getting cut off, or is that just Abby? You might want to open it up again, Abby, and uh, see if it's happening again. When you say the tops getting cut off, are you talking about this line here, Abby, or are you just talking about it's like actually just gone, it's like not there? Yeah, okay, That's, it's gone. That's not a good thing. Dailies is okay. All right. I think it might just be you, Abby. That's okay. Um, there you go. So that's uh, been about an hour, and uh, I'll leave you guys there. The words are mostly gone. It's interesting because it's it should uh, it's loading as like, because it, I scanned it on our photocopy here, it should be an image, so it just might be your computer. If you open it again, I have a feeling it might work. If it doesn't, I can print one off for you and uh, give it to you or have it available for you. Uh, I'll leave that there. Next day, tomorrow, we have an hour and a half. I will continue going through the uh, learning guide if you guys have any questions, the kind of course review learning guide. As well, I will continue to go through this exam. If nobody has any questions from the learning guide tomorrow, I will just you know, power through this exam and do as much of it as I can. So you guys have sort of those two things to look at. The, the learning guide you're going to submit, so that should be priority number one. This test is just a really, really good chance for you to kind of look at a, a recent provincial exam and give you an idea of what it's going to look like and the types of questions and how to approach it. And if you do need some extra help, I guess today would be the last day before the midterm for you to come in for some help uh, from 1 to 3 o'clock today at McWilliams Center. Uh, myself, I'll be available, and then Mrs. Parker will be available as well. So there'll be two of us here um, to give you guys some help. So consider that coming in if you're thinking you need some help. And that's it. So I hope you guys have an excellent afternoon. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning with uh, some more review. Thanks.